Well, uh, welcome everybody here. I know it's a little cold outside. Um, I came down from Hopi this morning. I didn't know I was going to quite make it because it was the snow. And um, I love the snow, but you know, only for my crops. <laughs> and so uh, here, uh, a little bit more back, 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 a little bit about myself and how I kind of got into this field. Um, I used to be when I when I graduated from Pepperdine University, I was employed by the United States Department of Agriculture under this organization called the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And uh, for the longest time when I was there, I was wondering, you know, why we were using all these different conservation techniques when they weren't really palatable to our area, you know. And then uh, how, how come we couldn't use our own conservation techniques to, and to get subsidization to help us, you know, employ people to actually do some of these things. And so that kind of framed my whole dissertation um, around, that, around that topic. And so ever since then, I've been kind of figuring out ways that we can show that, you know, um, even though that our, 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 our indigenous practices aren't, uh, scientifically validated, they are in a sense because we have over 10,000 years in some cases of replication. You know, as being a scientist, that's one of the main things. If you can prove something works over and over again for that, that type of year, it shouldn't have to be scientifically validated. It works. And then just our, 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 our being here today, you know, uh, uh, that, that just shows an example of resiliency and sustainability that's off the charts, in my opinion. But today I'm kind, of, I'm kind of really glad to be here. You know, I, this is the first time that I'm going to talk about this subject. This is something that I'm going to be going to. I just recently received an offer at the University of Arizona School of uh, Natural Resources and the Environment to be a faculty member there. So I'm going to hope it'll start that in May. So I'm very happy about that, you know. Um, I used to be, a, like, like uh, Norm was saying, I used to be a, a program officer at the, at the, for Na the Native American Agricultural Fund, which is a great organization that really framed me in what I wanted to do for my future. So. So this is the title of my, my topic, Indigenous Conservation, Restoration of the American Indian Food System. And how are we going to get there? I think, you know, how are we going to get there and why? What is the main reason that I'm trying to do this? First of all, why restoration? Because when I look at some of these statistics right here, it's, they're off the charts. Heart disease, cancer, um, diabetes, you know, cr chronic liver disease, strokes, you know, suicides. You know, it's just, how do, how, do, how, are we, how do we go from being so sustainable to having to have all these awful statistics? And what can, what can we do about that to get us back to where we were, to make us more healthier? First of all, you know, I want to point out, first of all, that we have this political relationship with treaties, executive orders, and laws, and et cetera, that are on the books. So we have this political relationship. Unlike the other minority groups, uh, they don't have that, so we're able to use that, and it's going to help me prop up some of my principles in the long run because of this political relationship. Oh, so this is kind of something I like to start about because I'm kind of going through the history of, of how we got to where we're at at the beginning, and then I'll go into the good stuff, you know, so don't get too depressed about this other stuff. And so, you know, it says, the utmost good faith shall always be absorbed toward the Indians. Their land and property shall never be taken from them without their consent, and in their property rights and liberty, they shall never be invaded or disturbed unless justified and lawful authors were authorized by Congress. But laws found in justice and humanity, humanity, humanity shall from time to time be made for preventing wrongs being done for them and for preserving peace and friendship with them. 1787, the founding fathers wrote that. 1789 was the founding of our U.S. Constitution. So what happened? <laughs> What happened between this time on our Constitution and, and, and uh, where we're at today? You know, why do we have such big statistics that we have right now, which aren't very good? First of all, you know, we had this Johnson versus McIntosh case in 1823. And for you guys who don't know anything about the Marshall Trilogy, I would, I would encourage you to read that because that's the basis of why we struggle what we do today. Because this particular case was like the discovery doctrine. You know, we have the right to occupancy on our lands, but we don't have the right to title. And when you don't have the right to title, you can't really get things done. You know, you can't develop things. In fact, all of our leases, of mineral leases that were on the reservations, we have to have the Interior Department approve those. You know, the energy company, ha BLM has to approve those. And so we're, we're not able to manage our lands effectively. You know, and so that's one of the main things. The other thing was the Indian Removal Act. You know, that's when the Supreme Court down and said, you're not supposed to remove the Cherokees. You know, they should have the right to stay there. But, but Andrew Jackson, in his, all his thinking, did it anyway. He said, let them decide what they want to decide, and, and we're going to move the Cherokees away. And so that was the Indian Removal Act. And then the Allotment Act of 1887. I think it was over 140 million acres that were in reservation. From there, we went down all the way to 55, you know, throughout the reservation. So that caused a lot of problems because what the allotment is, it gave the individual Indian 150 acres. But over time, now we have something like 300 people entitled to that 150 acres. So when I try to do conservation programs, I have to have signatures for everybody who owns a piece of that land. 
And that's almost impossible. So, you know, what I call this is the original harm. You know, um, it it's, it's wasn't the access to credit like the Keepsigle case was, which had to do with a class action lawsuit against the United States for basically discriminatory practices, lending practice for American Indian ranchers or farmers. It wasn't the Kobu case, which happened to do with the accountability of Indian trust land. It was the original harm to me was the destruction of our American Indian food system. That was the original harm. And so right now there's two key initiatives, because I'm a big traditional ecological and ecological knowledge pan. Well, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy validated this year in November that indigenous agricultural knowledge or uh, indigenous ecological knowledge was a science. And I've been talking about that forever. You know, I was kind of disappointed because, man, you know, I don't have to prove this anymore. It's a science, right? And so right now what they're trying to do is they're trying to come up with guidelines to actually initiate this and put this across federal agencies. You know, and I have a paper coming out on that, too. How are we going to incorporate this? How are we going to take our knowledge and not use it, not have it become, like, exploitive, you know, and extractive, and then we don't benefit from it? So I'm developing something on that right now. And also this joint secretary of order of fulfilling the trust responsibility to Indian tribes in the stewardship of federal lands and waters in the USDA between the United States Department of Agriculture and the Department of Interior. Now, I love these type of agreements, these mutual agreements of understanding, but we need to make sure that they're reinforced. We have laws in the books that can do that, but unfortunately they haven't been reinforced. So, you know, this is, why, this is the other reason why I'm doing this. Right now, indigenous people protect 80%, 80% of global biodiversity on a mere 25% of the planet's land with less than only 5% of the world's population. 80%. What happened to the rest of the biodiversity throughout the globe? You know? So that's why I want to try to develop programs that would allow us to, to not reinvent the wheel like regenerative agriculture is doing. That's a great, great, uh, great thing, by the way. I don't knock that at all, but we've done that. <laughs> we've been doing that for thousands of years. They just put a fancy name on it, you know? And so, but with this right here, this is important for us. And so what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel, like I said, but I want to bring the cultures back. I want to reinforce what's already out there, not only in the United States, but throughout the globe because we need to protect this 80% of global biodiversity. Because as a scientist, I know without biodiversity, we have no true sustainability. Does that make sense, a little bit? And so this is something that I'm working on. I'm developing this biodiversity map of Indian country. And so far, what I've found out initially is that only, we, only reserva reservations make up only 2.6% of, of the land, but yet we sit on 5.4% total of key biodiversities in the United States, key biodiversity areas in the United States. You know, and I think that's very, very important. So the reason to go into conservation to help develop this restoration of the American Indian food system is in place. We've got the policy, we've got statistics like this, and now after a while we're going to get the backing. And I'm going to bring not only, and I'll show that at the end of the thing, I'm not only going to bring in just the tribes and the federal government, but nonprofit agencies and so forth down the line to help us. Because this is a joint effort, you know, and not only will the benefits help us, but it'll also help the, the American citizens of the United States. So right now, the other reason for developing this is that right now only 2.7% of our land in total on Indian reservations has been developed. You know, that's it. And out of that 2.7, it's probably, it's probably less than that because, you know, sometimes we have jurisdictional issues like, for example, um, 80% of the, of the revenue in agriculture that's raised in Indian country is, 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 uh, is goes to non-Indians. And that's crazy. You know, why don't we have that capability of controlling that and keeping those revenues on our lands ourselves so we can benefit our own communities? So those are just some of the statistics. So it's just, it's just, so like when we look at carbon sequestration, everybody here, that's a big thing coming on right now, but you know, we, we're doing a proposal right now to study this. If just 10% of the estimated 56 2 point million acres of tribal lands held in trust by the U.S. were to be recognized as nature-based carbon removal priced at 30 per acre credit, that would generate approximately 160 million, 168 million in revenue. Just on only 10%, we're just looking at 10%, you know. But by doing this, I always have to remember that, you know, when things are developed on Indian reservations, we have to look at the exploitation factor. You know, because what happens if people start buying carbon credits out there on Indian reservations, they hold on to them until the market goes off the charts and they sell them and the tribes get left, left with just what they sold them for. You know, and so we have to be, have a very cautious uh, 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 plan to help alleviate some of that predatory lending. 
you know, and so that's part of what I'm going to do. I'm going to be doing a lot of things, you know, you know, not only that, I'm also a classically trained singer. I sing opera, believe it or not. I might come back here and do a concert, you know, but so come see that one. It's a whole different take on me. (laughs) (laughs) And so, you know, why are indigenous conservation land management schemes and agricultural systems so resilient? What makes these things so resilient, you know? This is my house out here on the Hopi Reservation, way down here, and these are my fields, you know, and uh, for me to grow corn in this environment, when I was at Cornell, they said I needed 33 inches of annual rainfall a year to grow corn. I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, what kind of corn do you guys grow, you know? <laughs> and so that was kind of fun to go to school there. But, you know, I think a, 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 lot of, a lot of this stuff right now is, you know, what I see, the difference is what, what makes it do that. It's our value systems are different. You know, our, our, Af- our American Indian agricultural, agricultural systems are different. Why is that? Because the values, though, this economically based, this is a windbreak. These are traditional windbreaks, by the way, at my place. These are the windbreaks for cattle and for commodity crops. You see the difference there? This one was built on for our own survival. We've been doing this for thousands of years. This is what makes us survive. You know, working with the environment. I always like to say that, you know, Hope is one of the few places that I know that we grow corn to fit the environment and not manipulate the environment to fit the corn. Does that make sense? You know, it's all place-based. And because it's place-based, it works very well in its area. Also, the continuity, replication, I just talked about that, right? So in 1915, you know, in, in, in 1901, these were taken, some photographs of our fields. This is my field in 2015, you know, both these in 2015. Bean crop here, corn crop here, corn crop here. But look at the, look at the continuity. Nothing's changed that much in over 100 years right there. And that's only a 100-year snapshot. If we had a Polaroid instant film thing, kind of dated myself, but if we did that, we could, we could take pictures, go back to like 1200 AD when we first got there, I believe. That's what the, that's what the archaeologists say, you know, but I don't know if that's true. I think we've probably been there longer, but, you know, it's that whole continuity. So why change something? You know, so when I was at NRCS, they had me come in, and they came in and said, why don't you guys use a cover crop or why don't you grow wheat? You know, what is wheat? You know, is it something I make fry bread out of, or what is it? You know, and it doesn't make sense to do that. And so we had to, so I had to try to change their mind. It says we don't need to, we don't need to re- re- redo our system. What we need to uh, help is to use funds to help us reinforce our system. You know, and that means labor. That means money for labor. You know, because kids nowadays they've changed their sense of direction. Sometimes you know you kind of have to offer them a little incentive to get out there, which is kind of sad, but you know it's necessary. So what is indigenous agricultural knowledge? Well, I call it, it's an applied knowledge for raising food and other agricultural products that is grounded in indigenous beliefs, in indigenous belief systems and practices which have been time-tested over millennia. Over millennia. And this comes off of a paper uh, that I have written that's been published now. Um, I would encourage you to read it if you were to look at my whole name. It's a, it's a, good, it's a paper focused on conservation outcomes. What it does is it takes three tribes and it shows, the, shows that what we do traditionally in our practices are just as valid as what the Natural Resource Conservation Service has as far as their conservation techniques, but they're not scientifically validated, and I talked about that. But 2,000 years, of 10,000 years of replication, they sure are validated. You know, think about that. They're a lot older than, you know, the original father of conservation, what Leopold said in Muir. You know, I think, I think Muir is the one that said, you know, it's not conservation, it's not natural if, if there's humans living in there. But I'm changing that because humans are, contra- are, are good at what they do. You know, I mean, I could just point out, for example, some of the Menominee Forest practice, some of the practices of the Yurok tribe on this movie called Inhabitants. I would encourage you to watch that. You know, these, these, these type of forest management practices where they go in there and they, you know, have these little mild burns, prescribed burns in their areas, you know, help a lot with fire suppression. Not only that, they help a lot, they help a lot with the biodiversity and biological ecology of the landscape. You know, for a number of reasons. So what are some of the barriers to resolution? What, what are the, some of the barriers to this restoration thing that I'm getting to? This is my house, by the way, on the Hopi Reservation. Small little place, about 12, 16, 16 square feet. You know, and so it's beautiful anyways. And so a lot of these multi-layered, tan, lanyard, multi-layered, lanyard, tan, lanyard, uh, multi-layered land tenure regimes are out there, you know, in... in, in America, we usually have like private property and have cover other, th- other things, and that's the only land issue they have to deal with. But, uh, but on most reservations, we have a lot of land, ceded land, fee simple land, trust land, village land, clan land. And each one of those has a different jurisdictional aspect of it. So when you try to do something in Indian country, you run into all these different jurisdictional problems. 
You know, and it's not our fault. We didn't put these systems up there. You know, the United States says you do this, this, and this, and through different hearings, we kind of got all, you know, messed up. You know, and so um, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do that one. Lack of capital, it's always a big one, right? We're wards of the federal government by, by, by law, but yet if you look at the per fundings that we get out there for conservation programs, it's hardly anything. I think we, I think we only, uh, out of the, out of the, um, 4,000 something contracts that were awarded for NRCS, equip contracts, environmental quality incentive program contracts, and conservation stewardship program contracts that help build conservation on Indian country. I think we got less than 1% of those, you know. And so where's the, fun the funding discrepancy on that? Lack of communication has always been a problem, you know. If we want to start at 1492, we can go there, but I'm not going to go that far back. <laughs> and so, you know, it's just hard for us to communicate because we look at things differently. You know, and so we need a lot of more effective consultation. Uh, institutional design flaws, like I just mentioned, you know, our ways of doing things are a lot different than what the federal government would have us try to do, you know. And uh, the lack of recognition, that's why I'm here, so we can become recognized. You know, I'm, I get tired of going to museums and seeing Indians in black and white pictures, you know. And uh, it kind of it bugs me, you know. We're, st we're here. We all don't have long hair and feathers and like we used to back, it, back in the uh, Dancing with the Wolf days, you know. <laughs> and so we've changed over time. So analysis of the barriers, you know, it says, like I said, many studies have examined conservation incentive programs in less developed countries, but only three in the United States. Why is that? Why don't we study our own, our own populations here in the United States and wonder why we're just like third world developing countries in most cases? You know, I know that there's the casinos out there. Some of them are, make, some are making, making good money. Some of them are increasing their capital and diversifying their economy, which is great. But the big land-based tribes are still struggling a lot. You know, they're still struggling just to get funding to do something, right? And so indigenous communities in developing countries face similar barriers as indigenous people in less developed countries. And I just said that. We have the same barriers here in as we do in third world countries. Why is that? As rich as the United States is. You know, I love the United States. I'm an American, you know. This is where I'm from. And this is a land that I'll always care about. But we just need a little bit of help to get over that. And so restoration is what I'm talking about. Notice that I use the word restoration not uh, whatever reconciliation or repatriation or whatever else is. I use restoration because it's already there, just a matter of restoring it, you know, to an extent where we benefit from it. So example, like I said, you know, in 2017, there was well, we only had 2% of the 49,000 NRCS contracts that rewarded. Uh, there is still a potential for NRCS to apply conservation practices on the 99 million of acres of American Indian lands. You know, I don't ever want to forget my brothers and sisters up in Alaska, you know, with climate change, my God, you know, some of their villages are just sinking, you know, they're, they're as, it, as it starts to thaw, you know. Um, like I said, I came out here in 1979, and this place is still going, you know, it's a beautiful place, you know, and I hope to come back here and do some more projects with the people here, you know, I really do. Uh, you know, why is this important? Because like I said, in under, the, under the 218 farm bill, there's 33.4 billion funding that they estimate will be available for all these federal programs down here. I don't know what the percentage of Amer what American Indians will have. I know what the new administration and my former boss, Janie Hip, at the United States Department, she's now the United States Department of Agriculture's General Counsel, you know, and our other person from the Indian Agricultural um, uh, Council, Indian Inter Intertribal Agricultural Council, Zach Ducino, he's now the Farm Service Agency administrative, administrative person. So we're getting our people in there, right? And I think that's half of our battle, guys. I mean, when I talk about recognition, it's, it's, we need to be in these positions where we're able to make a difference, you know? Until I got in my PhD, I was just, you know, no one talked to me. Now I, people like to talk to me. Not only that, but I bring a lot of substance to my conversation. You know, I think uh, when, I, when, I was, when I was giving a presentation, my, 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 uh, my chairman of my dissertation, she said, you know, we were, I was doing a, a, at a, an ecosystem service conference, and she said, looked at my presentation, says, we need to put a little bit more substance in there. You know, she says, you can be as charismatic as you want to, because you're good at that, but you need to have substance in your presentation. So ever since then, I've been putting substance in my presentation. <laughs> and I tell you that story because everything we do in Indian country needs to be backed up by data. And we just don't have the data. I mean, if you look at the weather stations, for example, on Indian reservations, if you were to put a map over what NOAA has, you would find very few, if any, on reservations throughout America. So we can't really participate in drought programs because we can't measure it. I can tell you, I can look at my plants and say, hey, look, this plant's not growing. We're going to have a drought. You know, that's part of my farming practices. I'll go in the spring and see what type of plants are available. Look at, because some of them have different shallow root systems, and I'll be able to tell a drought before it happens. 
but that's not good enough for the federal government. They, they don't want to come out there and look at my plants. They want the data, right? And so I'm trying to find ways to get the data to grow. So indigenous ingenuity already exists. This backs it up. This is, we've already done this for thousands of years. This was what I call the, 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 the original air conditioning of, of America right here. This is one of my rooms at home. It's a round structure. Uh, it's kind of like a kiva, and so I modeled this off the Chaco Canyon in Mesa Verde. And what happens here is this, when this temperature reach, off this fire gets to a certain degree, this thing starts sucking air from the outside down, down the, down the chimney. Blows up against the rock and circles it. That's neat. Huh? That's natural. You know? Original air conditioning, man. Can you believe that? And I don't even get, I don't even get a chance to copyright or patent it. You know? <laughs> so, you know, what I like to say, you know, Hopi farming practices and NRCS soil erosion, erosion and nutrient management practices, and this is kind of the focus of my paper, my recent paper. So when I look at this holistic approach, plant roles are spaced, agricultural fields, natural runoff, you know, I look at how NRCS sets up their standard practices, which comes out, by the way, by their field office technical guide. These are all numbered. Contour farming, crosswind trap strips, field border, nutrient management. They have the same conservation outcomes, folks. They do the same thing. Only thing I would say about these is that there's a lot more involved. There's a whole aspect of human well-being that this doesn't have because you're involving your whole community to get these practices to do this. It's a benefit of that, you know? I mean, shoot, I always tell, I tell people, you know, after the summertime, I drop about 20 pounds because I'm out there hoeing weeds and doing these things, right? I mean, this is better than the Jenny Craig diet for me, you know? <laughs> it works. <laughs> And so contour farming, like I said, this is what I'm going to talk, talk about. These are our practices, you know. Hopi practice, contour farming, NRCS standard practices, basically what this does is, is we plant crops perpendicular to, to run off, you know, to help with soil and wind erosion. You know, they call it contour farming. I don't know what we called it, but we've been doing this for 2,000 years. But this, this particular practice is subsidized by the federal government. Ours is not. Why? Because this isn't scientifically validated. Why not? I mean, my God, it's the same, you know? It's just framed differently, guys. It's just framed differently. So I'm here to show that there's a difference here, right? Here's another nutrient management. This is our nutrient management. So this is NRCS, you know, we put all kinds of stuff on. I don't know what this exactly is. Maybe it's manure or something. This is ours. I, we plant on alluvial floodplains most of the time, and so we're able to catch all that soil moisture coming in or all that new nutrients coming in off, off, the, off the mesa down into my field. This is all new soil with just one event. You know, that's why I don't have to rotate my crops. You know, I can grow corn. pH levels on this are still 7.3 to 8.3 for corn. That's, that's where it's supposed to be, according to what Cornell tells me. <laughs> I don't know sometimes, but yeah, that's where it's supposed to be. And so field borders, another method we've been doing too. You know, this is, probably, this is probably a little different now because they have to use their own plants, basically, if they don't use anything natural, you know. And so that costs the, that costs the operator money to put this in. Ours is, is free. Nature does that for us. You know, it's just using the natural environment wisely, you know, and uh, things like that. So, you know, now we can get on to the good part. What can the business of conservation help bring to Indian country? You know, this is our plan, and I'll talk about this a little bit. Reimagining native food economies. This is the regen seal that I'm trying to encourage the Intertribal Agricultural Council to get, to get going here, move it faster, because this is going to be like an organic label for Indian country. You know, the word organic is a little bit overused, in my opinion, because there's all different ways of measuring that. What is organic? You know, it's been, it's been laws are written, written about it. You know, it's just like the word sustainability. What really is sustainability? When you overuse a word a lot like that, you, it kind of loses its meaning, you know? But so I wanna, what I want to do, and I'm, we're starting to do this, is that we're going to make sure that this regen symbol on Indian products that we're using environmentally friendly practices, not necessarily what's out there, but what, what we've been doing for thousands of years. Now, how can you do that on a big scale? That's always a question. We can partner with people to help us do that. Indian country, we need to work with each other, period. You know, it's not about white, you know, an Indian or African American and white. It's, it's working together for the sustainability of our systems for ourselves to help us through the next phase that I think is coming, you know, with the climate. It's working together. That's why I'm here, you know. So, you know, when I'm talking about this restoration of the indigenous food system, economic centers and equity, part of this plan is to create these sub-hubs throughout the country. 
you know, that would incorporate things like processing centers, other things like that on the reservations. You know, sub hubs, and, and these little ones are, su are little sub hubs. Because right now, you know, when I was, when we had this, when we had this uh, COVID epidemic, which is still going on, you know, the St. Mary's Food Bank would come up with a big truckload of food, you know, it depends on how many people showed up, but there were four or five hour lines, but, you know, lately those trucks would go back half full because there's no place to store it. We don't have the infrastructure in place to do that. So what we're trying to do with this plan is we're trying to create that infrastructure, but I'm using conservation as a way to get there. You know, everybody wants to buy in on this, supply chain folks and everybody else. It's a matter of how can we put these, these rules and how can we put these, these policies together to make it happen. Wouldn't you all like to see something good happen? You know, I would, you know, for the benefit of everybody, not just, not just a particular group of people. We need something like this, America. Help, help bust up the, su the supply chain. I mean, my God, it's already busted, but, you know, four, four, four processing centers produce almost 80% of our, our meat that we buy at the grocery store, just four. And you wonder why you're paying as much as you want to. We start to do it regionally based, then we're cutting that out. Now, there's going to be a lot of protests like that because the ag industry, ag business has a lot of power in Congress, tremendous amount of power. So how do we break it? We get, we get the public to harness it because you guys vote. You know, and that makes a difference. You know, I don't want to get into politics here because I can go anywhere with that, but <laughs> but that's the way it is. <coughs> and so this is just some of the infrastructure right here that we're talking about. And you know, you can pull this off of the uh, Native American Agricultural Fund website. You know, all the brick and mortar stuff from conservation to key partners uh, to policy recommendations. You know, it's pretty much outlined in here. Like I said, you can get a closer in in in, in on this. So this is the part that I did was the conservation start. Of you know one of the main things like I'll talk about in a second is is how do we how do we how do we effectively use the federal government for our benefit and not being told what to do all the time, like I said with leases and stuff like that. You know conservation easements are a big thing. You know everybody wants to use conservation easements, but in Indian country why should we use that? We manage our land effectively. You know the whole Natural Resource Conservation Service used to be the sole conservation service was developed because of the mistreatment of the land. If we managed it effectively all these years, we wouldn't have to have those agencies. You know, it seems like to me we have to have laws because we don't behave ourselves, <laughs> right? And so that's what it's kind of about. So how do we get there? You know, this is kind of the, the nuts and bolts, right? How do we get there? How do we get to this, you know, how do we get to these pa 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 uh, partnerships, you know, through a technical, logistically, and financial partnerships? You know, we start doing this kind of like maneuvering where we have tribes, tribal NGOs, tribal colleges, universities, land grant institutions specifically, um, private entities, supply chain businesses, NGO, federal, state, and government. So we all have to kind of work together as a collective to thing like this. And when I'm talking about universities, land grant universities, I'm talking about because of the Morrill Act, the, the Mur Mural Act back in, I think, 1883 or 1892, that was land that was ceded to American Indians, but the universities are still benefiting from that. Every state has a land grant institution, by the way. But I'm going to go one level above that. What I'm going to try to do in Arizona as a pilot project is to is to let, you know, have a mentorship program so that indigenous scholars like me can go to NAU and teach for a semester, and any indigenous scholar can go down to U of A and teach for a semester, so that we're able to get more of our youth into, this, into these college programs if they want to go there, you know, and also as a way to, as a doorway, using land-grant institutions to actually almost make them required to work with tribal colleges, guys. You know, tribal colleges are really underfunded. They're way out there. We should have more what they call fur tip agents, which are ones who are basically Indian extension agents on the reservations. Every, tr every reservation should have one because I think those, those are the key things to get people to talk to each other, to understand the issues. You know, just like we have extension agents at on, on, on uh, certain campuses. You know, I know that all universities don't have extension agents. But they can if we were to have this, this, this built, you know, trifecta or... Re or approach to doing things, you know, bring more of us into the game, you know, uh, and I'd rather see if these land-grant institutions do live up to what they should live up to, we'll be able to have, like, free tuition for our native youth, you know, get them to go to school there, at the school of their choice, if we have that partnership, and I'm going to really work on that, you know, it might be a bad, bad uphill battle, but I can do it, I've got charisma, right, and so it, it might happen. <laughs> and so, you know, that's when I'm talking about federal and state governments and all this stuff will come together and we'll be able to work this all out, and it's just going to take time. It's going to take that trust responsibility, not only trust responsibility, but trust between everybody to, to work with each other. But it'll get there. And so how are we going to bring this all together? First of all, you know, we're going to have to enforce existing laws that are out there. These alternative funding arrangements in 2018 was passed. 
And what that does is it takes conservation programs, requires NRCS, and words says shall work with tribes to develop alternative funding arrangements. What that does is it allows the tribes to develop their own conservation program, and NRCS will supply the funding rather than us having to go through all this bureaucratic paperwork to get our, scientific, uh, our practices scientifically validated. We'll be able to use it that way. It's on the books, but the state conservationists are very reluctant to, do, to initiate this. Why? Because they're going to lose a lot of control over what they have. It's always about power, isn't it? You know, it makes no sense. You know, this Indian Agriculture Resource Management Act, the ARMP, the, Act, uh, the Agriculture Resource Management Plans are like this, the alternative funding arrangements. But again, this law was passed in 1993. In that law also includes a lot of money for scholarships who, who kids want to go into natural resource or agriculture or the agricultural fields. But it's never been funded by Congress. You know, why is that? Never been funded by Congress. It seems like every time we want to do something, it never gets funded. You know, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, 1975, we had to have that. American Indian Civil Rights Act, we had to have that. You know, it seems like we always have to have something. <laughs> because, w because when it comes to actual funding, if you don't use the word tribes with any funding bill that comes out, it just stays just a SERP at all. You know, we're the last to benefit from that. So, you know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs land status maps, that's a big one. You know, because the, on these allotments, if allotments are controlled by different entities. And so what happens without these land status maps? We don't know who owns what's out there on the Indian reservations. We don't. So how can we control something if we don't know who owns it? How can we set our own rules if we don't know who owns it? The, the Bureau of BIA has been very reluctant to show this, to give these to tribes. They should give them to them so they can control what's out there, but they don't. Why is that? You know, that's crazy. You know? And so, you know, to bring it all together, you know, how are we going to bring it all together? You know, like I said, we have this University of Arizona's Indigenous Resiliency Center, which I've been asked to be a faculty member of in my own, own department, old department. You know, we're going to start to work on these things, you know. And I'm not going to let it go. I don't let things go. You should see me plant corn. I do it every year, you know. And so it's just a matter of bringing people together and working with the other universities to get it to happen, you know. Because I don't, I don't think you can do anything by yourself. I'm just that type of person, you know. I, planting my field by myself takes me two weeks. I've got ten people up there. I'd get it done in an hour. You know, so it's really that cooperative approach that I, that I like to use when I talk, you know. And this is a picture of my house. You ever want to come in the area, come visit with me? I can always use people to help me cut, cut more stone and make it bigger, you know. It's kind of like a stone Lego house. <laughs> but it's beautifully made, you know, and it's an example. It's a, it's a testimony to our resiliency more than anything else, you know. And so this is, this are the Head Start kids, Hopi Head Start kids that came to visit me one morning, you know. I gave them an all in year of corn because our agricultural system says that our corn is like our mother. It takes care of us. It's who we are. So there's a whole Hopi saying that says we are like corn because we are. We're just like that. We grow, we mature, we, you know, we fade away. We come back and rejuvenate the next year, plant the next year, you know. I think that's the best thing. So it's, it's just making sure that these kids have a future just like everybody else, you know. I want to see them plant corn as long as they can, you know, and get the good, th good things that American has to offer, you know, and so... Any questions? You know, I'm kind of, I don't know how much, you know, I just want to say that, but appreciate that. Pre appreciate y'all being here for biking the weather, too. You know, I hope to come back here to, to Arcasante. But, Do yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes, I do. I'm off the grid. Yes, I do. I'm off the grid totally. You know, and so uh, it's, a, it's a great place to, great place to stay, and it's a, uh, I, I like to ha use it as a focal point when I bring people out here, groups and stuff like that, to show what we do as, as agriculturalists. You know, I hope to come back to Arcasante and also do some work here, too, just to show people how to plant corn. We're still teaching people how to plant corn. <laughs> oh, yes, I do. I have a satellite up there that runs that in a uh, HughesNet. You know, I'll give HughesNet a prop up, you know, but they supply me to supply my Internet and have, you know, I have truck and mowing water, of course, but have a on -demand, uh, I have an on-demand water heater and propane refrigerator, propane stove. And so, like, when the lights go off in the village, I'm there, man. I'm like the Christmas star of the Christmas tree, you know. Kukut's movie, between second and third Mesa. Did you have a question? Okay, go ahead, Eric. Well, you might have people follow you on Facebook. No, I think my, I think I, I yeah, I do have a, I have, I'm on Facebook a lot. That's where I put a lot of my stuff, Instagram. Instagram is, is Dr. Hopi Farmer. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> you know, and uh, Facebook, you just look up my whole name. Um, he introduced that. If you like to type in Michael Cotetto with Johnson, it's, it's in there. Yes, sir. It's amazing that you were beautiful to talk photographs of your home and, and what you're doing as a library. 
Thank you, thank you. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah. Uh, it's um, um, four ring salt brush, four, four ring brush, you know, just stacked up like that. Yeah, natural stuff. Um, it was stacked up there. Yeah, it was just me collecting dead, bu dead, dead, uh, dead salt brush and bringing it and planting it like that. Oh, that would be melons and, and uh, mostly melons and squash. Uh, they like the sandy soils. We're we're good at planting in sand. You know, we got we got got that figured out pretty good. And so I don't know if you've seen the movie Doom, but it's kind of like Doom out there. <laughs> Everybody's like looking at me. Y'all seen it? It's a good movie. So I feel like we're like that. <laughs> oh no, I don't have a well. I have I have. Uh, we don't irrigate. We don't irrigate our crops at all. You know, um, that's that's what makes them so resilient. You know, we have. Oh, I bring that in. That's that's uh, the village has their own well system, so we're able to drink water from that. Did you have a question back there, Brian? Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. No, not really. I think maybe for to, for lo for um, dedication of like a food processing center, I think that would be uh, valuable. But a lot of those lands, even though that law was enacted in 1995, 1995, they're still not put into trust. You know, and so you really don't want to develop something until it's put into trust. You know, as bad as, you know, the management uh, that I see sometimes of Indian country, if it's in trust, then the, the, the states can't tax it. You know, and, and, that's, and that's kind of a crazy thing because, you know, like when we had Peabody Coal Company over there, you know, uh, the Peabody Coal Company was making more, uh, the state of Arizona was making more in taxes than the tribes were in royalties, even if that was on our land. You know, and that's not right. You know, so that's another thing that needs to change. If we're going to harvest things and, uh, or, or bring things out, then we need to benefit from that food. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, our land, those lands that you're talking about are way away from our big population centers. I mean, there's 572 rec federally recognized tribes, and they're all different in the way they're arranged. But, it, but for me, it's like the only reason we have food deserts out there is we just don't have the bodies. You know, that's economics for you. If you don't have the bodies, you're not going to build a big chain out there because it's not going to be profitable. You know, that's, you know, who cares about, a lot of people say, who cares about, you know, whether or not it's good food or not. It's just, it's just not profitable for the companies to do that. So it's very hard to encourage businesses. Now, if we start building these processing centers in different locations and bringing some of this agri agricultural infrastructure like smart centers, then we'll get the population to stay there. You know, 60 to 70 percent of American Indians live off the reservation, you know. And so, but we have the bodies, then we got the stores, right? We've got the stores, then we could, then we can, you know, have our own set of, another set of income, another set of revenue. Any more questions? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Mm hmm mm hmm Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. Well, we... Well, it's, it, to me, it's against, it's the force of political pressure. You know, Halloran, he's on the Ag Committee. You know, he'd be able to help with that. You know, it's just a matter of getting the issue up front of, in front of him and, and telling things like that. It's, it's changing the law. You know, a lot of these programs like EQIP and CSP, even the Conservation Stewardship Program, they're designed for private, private property, huge tracts of land. 
you know, uh, there's not that much out there for the small farmer, you know, even though 70 percent, yeah, well, even though the 70, like I said, 70 percent of the, of the things that support sustainable throughout the globe are small farms, an acre, or eight, five, one, one to five acres, you know, and um, I'm just trying to, um, to figure out how to do that, but, you know, but a lot of this is based upon the market system, because we have a market system and that USDA has that, that focuses on um, uh, quantity and efficiency, you know, they, they, they want, they, and that's what it focuses on. And so what do you have to do to, be, to have quantity and efficiency? You have to use all these things, all these variables like pesticides, herbicides, you know, and that doesn't do anything any good. So well, that needs to switch out. Now, we're talking regenerative agriculture. It's a great thing. But you're going to ask a conventional farmer to, to change when he's already hitting his bottom line all the time. How are you going to do that if he doesn't have something to change over three to five? It's going to take three to five years on average for a person to go from conventional to regenerative but there's no banking system that's going to loan that kind of money to anybody to basically five years and, you know, are they, they going to actually change it over? You know, is it going to be, is it going to help that person who's struggling right now to pay for his equipment and everything like that? No, it's not. So we need to have a more bigger financial institution as we could buy into that. Yeah, NRCS has what they call state technical committees. And so, you know, if you're able to join one of those or, or even your conservation district, you know, uh, join one of those and see what happens. You know, I, I just, it just takes time. You know, the federal government doesn't move fast. You know, the, all the new stuff that's coming down the line, the infrastructure and the climate stuff that's going to be coming out, it's going to take some time. Uh, for me, it's just a matter of just, you know, finding also as we start going to these programs in Indian country again to make sure that we have like a, a data center that we're able to control what we, what's, out, what's going away from us. Seems like everybody wants to use indigenous knowledge to make themselves better, but uh, sometimes we have to watch out what we're doing so we don't just exploit things. You know, that's I'm, I'm a believer in that. Did you have some questions now? You got going. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you. And thank you for you for Okay. Thank you for thank you for that. I really appreciate that. You know, I, I think that's one of my main things is that when I give a talk, I don't want to bring it I don't want to make it like me against you or, or bring all that stuff in. I want to work with people. And I think, you know, the language I used to choose to use is one of, 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 um, of not only reciprocation, but one of community building, you know, because we all live in the same world. I mean, when we have our ceremonies. We, we pray for everybody, you know, and that's what we do at Hopi. Go ahead, man. Oh, no, we don't. I mean, we don't. Uh, we don't. We're not, we're not supposed to do that, but I know that some people do that, and that's okay, too. That's up to them, but uh, we usually don't do that. Oh, <laughs> oh, probably blue, white, yellow. We have 21 different varieties. Um, depends on uh, fast varieties. You can do that. I mean, you can. There's like native seed search down below there. They have that. You know, there's other areas that have that. Native seed search. They have a lot of the seeds down there, too, and there's just different companies that offer that. Thank you for thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Yes, yes, ma'am. Oh yeah, it's we've we've our seasons are getting shorter, you know, um, um, and we are experiencing that, you know. But I think, you know, I think um, the thing that drives us as far as 
a little bit different than that is that we plant no matter what. So whatever I see uh, in the field, even though I know it's going to be a drought year, I plant anyway because that's what my faith tells me to do. And that's a big thing for me. And so uh, I'm able to raise, uh, like last year, for example, I there was was going to be a drought. I plant my corn anyway, not the whole thing, but just a fork of it. And uh, I didn't get any, nothing came up until July, I mean, until August after our first big monsoon raising. And then I was able to get a small crop, not just, not just to, for seed, but to help feed myself and then m- m- members of my family and, and other people. Just like that, because I, I planted it. Now, if I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to be negative, I'm not going to plant anything, I'm going to save my seeds because they're not going to make it, wh- where would my faith be, you know? And so, but that's a whole different topic. But thank you for asking that. Go ahead, sir. I'm curious if you collaborated all on either the Hopi Supreme Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Susan Zakakaku, she's the FERTEP officer. She's been there for about four years now, uh, and I do work with Hopi Permaculture. Uh, the Lillian Hill who was there, she's now head of the Native Americans Food Sovereign Alliance. She's directing there, but they're trying to, I think, fill the position so that they can keep going. I like that program, by the way, because, you know, at Hopi Permaculture, we're able to use VISTA funds and Peace Corps funds to actually employ our own people, you know, and so because, if, as you know, you know, these, these programs require housing Housing on reservations is very limited. So if you're able to employ your youth, then you're able to build up not only, you know, th- help them out, you're able to help yourself out. Because those young kids that come out and do thing, put things like windbreaks in, that's invaluable. You know, it's, that's a real thing. Oh, yeah, it would be too. Exactly, exactly. Yep, exactly. Do you have a question back there, Miss? Uh, there's technical, uh, te- st- state technical committee. Yeah, those are the ones that the NRCS has. If you go to their website, there's a whole explanation about what those do are what they call conservation district boards. And throughout Arizona, each, each, so certain regions have their own conservation district. And so they do have those meetings, I think, monthly, um, pretty much. So that's a good way to put input into those kind of things. Um, I just encourage you guys, you know, if you do anything in life, go out and Go to a place and buy some seeds and get a little pot and grow something, man. You know, it's such a good thing. Even if it fails, you're doing it. My God, that could be your small contribution to helping the atmosphere. <laughs> Just a little plant. You know, it's important. Yes, yes, sir. Well, the thing with that is, you know, we look at the Navajo Nation and the, and the Hopi Nation and some of the other ones that got these big uh, introduction of livestock. You know, it used to be sheep. You know, way back in the 1800s, the government came out there and, and did all this. And what happened was that we started overgrazing, and then what happened was that they took them all away. <laughs> you know, started taking them all away, and we wound up starving. You know, a lot of us started starving. And, um, and, but to me, it's not so much about, you know, uh, it is about managing the thing properly, but we just don't have the training, in my opinion, to do that properly. And, uh, and then plus there's no incentive. So if I were to have a meat processing center on the reservation, I would say, I'm going to give you this much for this type, of, this type of beef or this type of cow. Then you have the incentive to go manage it properly. If you don't have an incentive to do something, it doesn't have to work. And so as a result of that, you have all this overgrazing occurring. You have, you know, stories where they have to put down 2,000 horses. You know, you have all these horror stories, you know, uh, because, it's because there's no incentive. I mean, you give something somebody to somebody, and then you expect them to take care of it. When there's no incentive to do that, it doesn't do anything. It's like another sort of form of welfare, Why you know. You yeah, exactly, exactly. It doesn't work, and so uh, that's why that's why the land's changed, and uh, it's changed a lot. Five hundred years is a lot of time, you know. It's changed tremendously, and um, I don't know quite to do what to do about that. But oh yeah. Well, this, th- this land behind me, no, there was not. This has always been like this, you know. That's why we're familiar with this place. That's why every single conservation tech we, technique we use basically is to use to preserve soil moisture. Soil moisture is what you need to grow things, right? And so all these techniques are designed to do that. Even from, even th- even these planting in clumps like this, someone called me the bush master one time <laughs> because, because I have all these, you know, my corn looks like bushes, right? 
And so I was able to, but you know, it's, it's grown like this in the spacings in this because we want to optimize the amount of soil moisture availability throughout the season. You know, this is a good year, so I didn't have to thin it out, but usually during a, a bad year, I'll have to thin it down to six to seven, three to four stocks per, year, per, per in the summertime in July, you know, and so, but this all is designed to conserve soil moisture. Our planting depths, for example, go anywhere from six inches to almost two feet deep, depends on the, what we see. You know, and so, but this is, this is environmentally friendly farming right here. You know, growing corn with only 6 to 10 inches of annual rainfall a year when I was told I needed 33 is amazing. This is a testimony to our survival. What? Well, there's a number of reasons, but the other reasons for these clumping is, is because, you know, it gets hot out there, so they're able to shade each other. They're, they prevent each other from lodging, you know, so they don't just fall over like you see some places like that. Plus the, plus the varieties, they're, they're not what they call genetically modified or organisms. They're, they're heirloom varieties, and so they're able to tolerate different diseases. So a disease can't just jump from plant to plant, you know, because they're different like that. Uh, and so th the biodiversity is here. It's a matter of harnessing that. Mm -hmm. the didn't all what kind of that. Drought. Drought. Mm -hmm. Not enough water. But when I was in, but that when I was in, um, when I was uh, doing some scientific experiment, or just you know helping, assisting as a volunteer to teach these disadvantaged school children how to how to farm. Biosphere sent down their thing. They wanted to grow it, grow it like they did at Biosphere, and and so they gave them the seeds and they set up a little mini experiment like they do at Biosphere. And for two months after we planted those seeds, those seeds didn't come up. And I was like, and every time I went over to those fifth or sixth graders, after about, about the eighth week, they didn't want to take me out to their experiment anymore because it wasn't growing. And I felt so bad for them. So I said, I'm going to go to my house. Because I always carry corn seed with me. I'm like, you know, the, the, Johnny, the Johnny corn seed guy, right? And so, you know, I took some of those. We planted them. And we did a drought, a drought experiment where we watered one for one once every week and one once every three weeks. And the one that we watered less did better. But it was just getting those kids excited about it. You know, showing that it's having them watch something that grows rather than doing a scientific experiment doesn't work, right? So let's have something do that. Let, let me have a 100% success rate like I do with my seeds. My seeds always come up, you know, unless it's not enough moisture. But that's what it is, you know. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to start talking to monetary thing. But anyways, yeah, so that's kind of how it works with me as far as I'm concerned. But yeah, yes, sir, way back there. No, we're, we're about probably 90 miles from the Colorado River. And so ours primarily relies upon springs. Uh, but I'm, I'm pretty sure the water tables dropped because of the, the Peabody Pole Cocoa Clooney was just slurring water, you know, out from that aquifer that we usually drink from that was feeding all these springs. So that, those are kind of disappearing. Uh, but um, I'm not a hydrologist, but uh, that's, that's what's happening. Uh, and so the water table is a lot lower, so it's a little bit, it takes a little bit more for the moisture to get there. That's why we rely upon snowfall. Snowfall is our biggest contribution. If we get over eight inches a year, then we're going to have a pretty good crop. You know, I mean, during the wintertime, if we have less than that, then we don't, it's hard to judge if we're going to have a good crop or not. And then the monsoon rains, like, like two years ago, we didn't have any monsoon rains, and those crops needed to be fed something. You know, we don't, we don't believe in irrigation. We've never done that before, but that... But I'm also starting to change a little bit, you know, and uh, come up, trying to come up with pilot projects where we're able to raise little small outcroppings of crops to give to our people because what happens is when you lose those seeds, you lose them forever. And so we need to hold on to those drought-resistant strains in some way. But yes, sir, Gary. Um, it takes a while. Some of them are there, uh, but there, it takes a long time for them to come back. I've seen some of them come back, but, you know, it really depends upon how much moisture we, go, we get, you know, throughout the year because uh, it fer fer fertiles down, as you know, and so uh, there would be some things that I would like to try to do, the r restoration effort out there more. They've done some of that work already, but there's a lot more that could be, that could be useful. Um, yeah. No, there's a there's a few a few like in Hope Villa and another uh, couple of villages they've developed that where the gardening's still there. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the people interested to do that and, and getting the youth, especially the youth. That's why these programs like Help You Permaculture and the Not When You Foundation 
on the Hopi Reservation are very useful to get the kids involved in that. Um, that's, that's the way it should be. Did you have one more question? Yeah, I'm just curious about the way the presentation You have a house there, you have a community. Mm -hmm. Do you have a deed to that? No, I don't. I mean, that's land tenure. I mean, this is the land that I'm farming on is our clan land. See, that's how it's arranged out on Hopi. Every, every tribe is different, but we have certain specific areas that we use for farming. And so my clan farms this area. So when I leave, that house is not mine. That is, and that fields aren't mine. It belongs to, it belongs, it's kept in, it, and it's kept in um, the system by the women. The women basically own this. The women own the land. They, I mean, they own the fields. They own the harvest. They own the house. You know, um, I just own myself, you know. And, and uh, sometimes I think I'm a Hopi Shrek because I just go out there and move things around. But, you know, it's, it's, it's designed, it's designed, actually, our system is designed that everybody benefits, and it's designed to, be between the genders, it's designed to balance our society out. That's what a matrilineal society is. It ba balances us out, you know, rather than, because if you let me do everything, I'll just become like the mean Shrek, you know, and so it's better to, the women are the ones that control all that stuff, and that's important in our society. They're, they're the backbone of our agricultural system, I'd have to say.